we're going to be looking at stress and strain. Studying physics, you'll appreciate that your brain is under a lot of stress, which gives rise to a lot of strain, resulting in several headaches. So stress produces strain. The definition of stress is the force applied divided by the cross-sectional area, or force per unit cross-sectional area. So here you have a material, cross-sectional area A, and original length L, and you're applying a force along the cross-sectional area. So we have stress. The units of stress is given by the units of force, which is newtons, divided by the units of area, which is meter squared. So that is newtons per meter squared, which is also Pascal. When we apply this stress, the material extends, and so we have a strain. And strain is defined as extension divided by the original length, or it's the ratio of extension to original length, or we could say it's the extension per unit original length. The units of strain, well, it has no units, and that's because you have the units of extension, which is in metres, divided by the units of length, which is metres. You've got metres divided by metres, so that cancels out, so you're left with no units. You can have a tensile stress and strain. Tensile means you are stretching, extending the material. Or you can have a compressive stress and strain. So that means you're squashing, reducing the size of the material. A material that returns back to its original length after you have removed the deforming stress or force is known as an elastic material and examples would be copper for low stresses that is stresses below the elastic limit also cast iron and glass however a material that does not return back to its original length after you remove the deforming stress or force is known as a plastic material so that material has a permanent change in length so we say it's permanently deformed. And so examples would be copper for high stresses, so that is stresses above its elastic limit, and polythene. A material that can be shaped by stretching, so for example being drawn into a wire like copper, is a ductile material. And ductile materials have large plastic regions. So a ductile material must be plastic because you have a permanent change in shape by stretching. The maximum stress that you can apply to a material before it breaks is an indicator of its strength. So the maximum stress that you can apply to copper is much greater than the maximum stress you can apply to glass. And so we say copper is stronger than glass. The amount of stress you need for a given strain or the amount of stress per unit strain is an indicator of the stiffness of the material. So if we consider cast iron and glass and it needs a certain amount of strain, then cast iron would need a lot more stress than glass. So we would say the stiffness of cast iron is greater than the stiffness of glass. And finally, a material that breaks cleanly, so it breaks without any plastic deformation, so it is not a plastic material, we say it's brittle. And so examples would be cast iron and glass. This is a stress strain graph for copper. So you can see initially we have a straight line through the origin. 
which indicates that the stress is directly proportional to the strain. So in this linear region, we can say Hooke's law is obeyed. Point A represents our elastic limit. So it's the stress beyond which the material, in this case copper, is no longer elastic. So above these stresses, the material will not return back to its original length after the deforming stress has been removed. B is known as the yield point. Beyond the yield point, you can see that you've got a significant change in the gradient of the graph. And what this is showing you that a small increase in stress is giving you a much bigger increase in strain. And so the stiffness of the material has changed, so it's less stiff. C is known as the ultimate tensile stress. So this is the maximum stress you can apply to the material before it breaks. So it's an indicator of the strength of the material. And usually at the ultimate tensile stress, the material will break. However, for copper, it doesn't break at C. So if you remove the ultimate tensile stress, and apply a stress that is slightly less than it, then the material will break. So D is known as the breaking point or breaking stress. However, for most materials, point C and D are the same. So the ultimate tensile stress will be the breaking stress. And finally, because copper can be drawn into a wire because it's got this large plastic region, we can say it's a ductile material. Here are the stress strain graphs for cast iron and glass. So you can see for both of them, they have a straight line through the origin. So we can say that they obey Hooke's law. Stress is directly proportional to strain. They're also elastic materials. They do not show any plastic behaviour. However, they're weak. Their maximum tensile stress is low, much lower compared to copper. And they're brittle materials. It's important to note as well that the gradient for the cast iron graph is greater then the gradient for that of glass and the gradient is representing the stress per unit strain so that is an indicator of the stiffness of the material and if you remember previously we said the stiffness of cast iron is greater than that of glass so for the same strain cast iron needs more stress here is the stress strain graph for copper. So loading is when we're adding stress. Unloading is when we're removing stress. And so you see they don't follow the same pathway. However, we do see that by unloading, we get back to a strain of zero, which means an extension of zero. So the material is re returned back to its original length after the deforming stress has been removed. So it's an elastic material. However, even though that the material is elastic, the graph is not showing a straight line through the origin. And so stress is not proportional to strain. And so rubber does not obey Hooke's law. We can see that the area under the graph during loading is greater than the area under the graph during unloading. The area under the graph is an indicator of the strain energy or the elastic potential energy that you're giving to the system and then taking away from the system. So that means 
the elastic potential energy or the strain energy gained by the material during loading is greater than the strain energy or the elastic potential energy it lost during unloading. So that means we've lost some energy and that energy has been wasted in the form of heating the material while you've changed its length, while you deformed it. This is the stress strain graph of polythene. So again, you can see that the graph for loading, adding the stress, is different for unloading, removing the stress. So that means some energy has been lost as heat while the material has deformed. You can also see that after unloading, so when you've removed all the stress, the material still has a strain, so that means it still has an extension, so that means it's permanently deformed, so it's a plastic material. Polythene also has a low stiffness, that means it has a small stress per unit strain.